Welcome to the Warhammer 40k lore iceberg. If you just want to watch the video and skip all my rambling in the intro, go to this point. But first, I still feel like I should explain what this video is, for those who have not seen an iceberg video yet. Basically, we take an iceberg chart that someone had made, which consists of some points, in this case it's Warhammer 40k lore, and the points get more and more obscure as we get deeper into the iceberg and further into the video. This particular iceberg was posted on the Green Dunk subreddit by the user Asad Ravioli. So shout out to him for taking the time to do it. And just a quick heads up, I won't get super deep into every single point on this iceberg. I'll try to do my best, but realistically there is tens of hours of content in this picture. So if you are interested in one particular thing, there is probably a video about it somewhere on YouTube that is longer than this whole video. So without further ado, let's go. The Imperium are not the good guys. When you first get into Warhammer 40k by playing a game or reading a book, you might get the wrong idea that humans are the good guys in this universe, but that is definitely not the case. Throughout its history, the human race underwent a lot of changes, with one of the biggest turning points being the end of the Unification Wars, when the Emperor took control and became the figure of absolute power. And he definitely did not use that power to spread the message of love and acceptance, but rather that of hatred towards Xenos and towards people who wouldn't agree with his rule, and things remained in that state ever since, you could say that they even got worse over time. So now, during the 41st millennium, the Imperium of Men is a society controlled by a bunch of crazy fanatics who worship a person who's been almost dead for 10,000 years, and by people who just want power for themselves and don't really care about anyone below them. Basically, the actions of the ruling forces like the Emperor, the High Lords of Terra, the Inquisition or the Ecclesiarchy have led to avoidable deaths of untold billions of people. And not only because of war, but because of poor work conditions, poverty or just simply being forgotten and left alone at the mercy of the galaxy. So yeah, people are the bad guys. Well, at least the higher ups. The regular people are just unlucky to live in these conditions and be brainwashed from birth with the Imperial agenda. The Horus Heresy this is definitely one of the most important events in the history of Warhammer universe. It was first mentioned in 1988 in the first edition of the miniature game rulebook, and later it became so huge that it had a 60 novel series written about it. The story begins at the end of the Great Crusade with things looking very good for the Imperium, with the Primarchs behaving really well and acquiring new worlds for the Emperor every day. But it all soon turns to shit when Horus, the most powerful of all of Emperor's children, gets corrupted by the forces of Chaos, takes with him half of Astartes' legions and starts a huge war against the Imperium of Men that lasts for almost 10 years and ends with a climactic fight of Horus and the Emperor during the Siege of Terra. Horus dies in that battle, but before that he manages to mortally wound the Emperor who has to be seated on the Golden Throne, which eventually leads to the Age of Corruption and Stagnation within the Imperium. The Lost Primarchs so Emperor created 20 Primarchs, but only 18 of those are known to us. The remaining two being the 2nd and 11th were never revealed. In the lore it is said that the records of their existence have been deleted from Imperial records and it is forbidden to talk about them. However, they were mentioned in the novels quite a lot of times, so we do have at least some snippets of information to work with. We can learn that even the 18 other Primarchs aren't allowed to talk about what happened, but we can learn that the two Primarchs have overstepped a line in some way, perhaps committed some horrible atrocity, and this happened presumably during or after some gathering of Primarchs, as it seems from this piece of dialogue. Oh, and the Emperor is deeply saddened by what happened, but that shouldn't be a surprise. From other pieces of lore, we know that the whole cleansing happened during or right after the Rangdan Xenocide campaigns, that happened roughly in the middle of the Great Crusade, so like 100 years before the Horus Heresy. Uh, these campaigns were fights between the Imperium of Men and the Xenos of Rangdan species, which were a highly advanced race. Uh, this war lasted for 60 years and ended with a complete extinction of Rangdan and heavy losses on the human side. However, it is unknown what the Lost Legions were exactly doing during that time. We just know that they were there. But what is the real reason behind the existence of Lost Primarchs? Well, many people seem to think that it is to encourage people to create their own legions, and while this is super cool and wholesome, I couldn't find any official info from the Games Workshop that would confirm this. Uh, however, I found this interview with Rick Priestley, the guy who originally designed the missing Primarchs, 
and he said that it was just to give the players a bit of a mystery. The link to full interview will be in the description. The Eldar are doomed. It's hard to feel sorry for the Eldar, but yeah, it looks like they are completely doomed. First of all, they are forced to live in the shadows of their great past, once the rulers of the galaxy, now a relatively small race of probably less than a trillion. That combined with their slow reproduction cycle and constant war will make it really hard for them to repopulate the galaxy. But why did they lose their greatness? Well, everybody knows that they fucked a little bit too hard and accidentally created Slanesh, who is a crazed chaos god with an appetite for Eldar souls, so if an Eldar happens to die, Without the spirit stone, which is a device that will trap the wearer's soul in the case of death, the elder's soul automatically goes to Slanesh for some afterlife fun. And when I say fun, I of course mean unimaginable agony. So as long as Slanesh exists, the elder are doomed. And I imagine that it is quite hard to destroy an abstract idea of emotional excess that exists in a parallel dimension created from trillions upon trillions of emotions. The golden throne is slowly failing. The origins of the Golden Throne have always been unknown. We can only be sure that it was found by the Emperor during the Unification Wars on Terra. And it was probably used by people during the Dark Age of Technology to access the Webway, which is a part of the Immaterium used by the race of the Old Ones to travel across large distances in the galaxy millions of years before the creation of the Imperium of Man. So the throne wasn't definitely designed to be a life support machine. And it seems like the humans are lucky that it did that for 10,000 years already and it shouldn't come as a surprise that it is starting to fail. But what is exactly happening to it? From the 6th edition of the Warhammer Core rulebook, we know that by the end of the 41st millennium, the throne requires 4 times more cycle sacrifices to run on optimal settings. So it looks like, at the point of the story where we are now, 4,000 cycles are killed every day just to keep it running. And from the 5th edition Konu book, we know that in the last year of the 41st millennium, tech priests discovered some failures in the mechanisms that are impossible for any human to repair. It actually got so bad that a member of the Inquisition named Adamara Rasilo smuggled a dark Eldar homunculus onto the surface of Terra so it would help with repairing the Golden Throne. This story was told in the Vault of Terra novels and it has to be one of the craziest ideas in the Warhammer 40k lore. Anyway, the homunculus didn't really want to cooperate and instead of fixing the throne, he started to brutally kill people and was eventually disposed of along with the Inquisitor who brought him to Terra. Uh, and as improbable as it sounds, that is not the end of men dealing with the Dark Eldar. As after all of this had happened, there was a huge human expedition into the city of Komora, the home of Dark Eldar, when a certain dark bargain was struck. We don't know what the deal was just yet, but we can assume that it probably has something to do with maintaining the throne, since it looks like some people within the Imperium of Men know something about Dark Eldar being able to repair or at least maintain it. It's also worth mentioning that the status of Golden Throne might be much worse due to actions of Magnus who was a primarch of the Thousand Suns Legion who wanted to warn the Emperor about Horus and his heresy, so he decided to make an astral projection of his body, but he kinda didn't have enough power to do that, so he kinda took some power from an unknown warp entity and kinda created a bridge into the webway, which allowed the demons to invade it and kill like 10,000 mech priests who were working on the throne at that time, and start a 5 year war on Terra, so yeah, that might have ruined the throne a bit more. The Imperial Lie uh, it's the idea of the great lie that lies behind the imperial truth, which was the ideology enforced by the Emperor of Humanity during his conquest on Terra and later the galaxy. The imperial truth was mainly about rejecting everything that had to do with spirituality, be it religion, sorcery, the belief of having a soul, and just anything that had to do with faith in general. Instead, people were told to believe in science and logic, so by the Emperor's orders, all religious temples found during the Unification Wars and during the Great Crusade were destroyed, and all religious rituals were forbidden. But what about the lie? Well, the Emperor knew all about the ruinous powers of chaos, and he knew exactly how easy it is for people to fall for them. So the real reason behind the whole ideology was to make it harder for forces of chaos to unbind minds of regular men, as we learned from the Master of Mankind novel. Which isn't necessarily all bad, I guess. I mean... He could have created an education program and just teach all the people about the dangers of the warp and why they shouldn't do any kinky stuff when they fuck, but let's be honest, if something like the warp and demons and hungry chaos gods existed in the real world, 
I might have actually been good with not being educated on that and just indoctrinated into believing that there is only science and we are the strongest force in the universe. Mm, but sadly for the Emperor, the Horus Heresy happened and your average terror citizen got exposed to the knowledge of the Immaterium. And a couple years later, the Emperor's death kickstarted the biggest religion in the galaxy, quite ironically. The Ethereals use mind control to dominate the Tau. This is something that is somewhat implied in the lore but not exactly confirmed. Uh, the Tau are for sure controlled by the Ethereals, but we don't know how or to what extent. Uh, we know for sure that there is something unnatural happening and uh, devotion to Ethereals doesn't come only from tradition and, you know, their communistic propaganda. Uh, the most info about this comes from the 6th edition Tau Codex and the Death Watch Mark of the Xenos RPG book, from which we learn that if an Ethereal dies, and the nearby Tau feel like something worse off of them, and they feel extreme emotions in the form of grief and anger. Uh, so it is currently unknown how the Tau do it. Even in the lore, the human scientists are arguing about it, with the probable explanations of the ability to control Tau being some special pheromones, or the organ on their foreheads giving them mind control powers. The Sensei the Sensei are characters that first appeared in the first edition of the game and later only a couple of books, and they are the actual biological children of the Emperor. Uh, as stated in the books, the Emperor, before he became the Emperor, had lots of, and I mean lots of, sex with a lot of women. And he had fathered many children, male obviously. Uh, the best thing about the children is that they were immortal and they were all blanks, uh, which meant that they were all resistant to psychic powers and they were also infertile for some reason. And let me tell you, they were some of the most overpowered men in the galaxy, viewed by some as absolute heroes and by some as immortal devils. Um, they were immune to chaos, they had their crews consisting of warriors, psychers and even xenos. Uh, oh, and guess who their enemy number one was? The fucking Illuminati. I kid you not, the Illuminati is canon to the universe of the Warhammer 40k. Uh, if you don't believe me, go to any Warhammer wiki and just see for yourself. Um, anyway, the Illuminati were going to gather the Sensei and kill them at the moment of Emperor's death to give him enough psychic power to be reborn as the Sensei Emperor. Yes, this is real. Uh, I feel like the Illuminati should have their own point of the iceberg since they were unknown even to the Emperor and only after his death they were discovered by the Inquisition and even had some members of the Inquisition join their ranks. Oh and they had an inside faction called Ordo Hydra, uh, which wanted to cause the third impact and unite all human minds into LCL soup. Anyway, the Sensei and Illuminati are old lore at this point, and they haven't been mentioned for like 30 years, and in canon they were deemed as heretics, so it's unlikely that we will ever see them again. And that's probably good. Cypher. Cypher is a very mysterious figure in the lore, and a rare case where it seems like he is working for himself and not any bigger organization. He might be a member of Fallen Angels, a traitor chapter of Space Marines, but this doesn't mean that he works for the forces of chaos. Uh, he rather distances himself from the Imperium, uh, as he is known to attack both Imperial and Chaos servants. He might be a perpetual, since it looks like he has been alive for 10,000 years, uh, during which he was fought to be killed many times, but he always comes back somehow, and whenever he appears, death usually follows him. Also, he appears to be working on some bigger plan, but nobody can say what it is, and if it will be good for the Imperium or not. The man is basically a ghost. He appears out of nowhere, kills a bunch of people, and disappears for a thousand years without a trace. The Alpha Legion are loyalists. The Alpha Legion is a space marine legion with possibly the most convoluted backstory, which I won't even try to explain here, but all you have to know for now is that it's a region with two Primarchs that like to switch their names once in a while to commemorate each other and to confuse the reader, and also to retcon conflicting backstories. Anyway, the official version of events is that the Alpha Legion turned to chaos during the Horus Heresy. Uh, from the novel Legion, we know exactly how it happened. Alpharius, the bigger of the two Primarchs, was contacted by Xenos called the Cabal, who successfully persuaded him to join the Chaos with a thought experiment. And they basically showed him two visions of possible outcomes of the Horus Heresy. Uh, if the Emperor wins, the humanity will live for 10 to 20,000 years, but will eventually succumb to Chaos after that time, since the Emperor will never have enough power to stop people from experiencing emotions that power the Chaos Gods. <coughs> On the other hand, if Horus wins, he would be struck with guilt of killing his father, which would result in him starting a war against all of Chaos, 
and in the end the destruction of human race, but also the destruction of Chaos Gods. So on one hand we have all the humans dead or worshipping Chaos, and on the other hand we have all the humans dead but all the Chaos Gods also dead. Presented with the choice, the Alpha Legion Primarchs decided to side with Horus, as they believed that this would ultimately lead to the better outcome. So their allegiance is really hard to grasp, they definitely turned against other legions during the Horus Heresy, killing many other Emperor Loyalists, but their battle cry remains as for the Emperor, which could be seen as a mockery, but I think that they truly believe that they are fulfilling the Emperor's will by acting directly against him. The Machine God is the Void Dragon. Let's start off by saying that the Void Dragon is a member of the Catan race, one of the most powerful races to ever exist in the universe. In fact, as we know from the 3rd and 5th edition of Necron Codices, the Catan were born at the moment of creation of the universe. At first, they were beings that would cling to a star and feed off of its solar power, not really caring about anything material. And that was changed when they were somehow contacted by the Necron Tyr, one of many ancient humanoid races. The Necron Tyr gave Catan bodies made of special living metal, and the Catan quickly used their godlike powers to enslave the Necron Tyr and turn them into Necrons, mindless servants made of the very same metal. And eventually the Catan started feasting on the life power of the now deceased Necron Tyr. A lot of stuff happened after that, like the War in Heaven for example, and the Necrons eventually rebelled and destroyed the Catan, turning them into shards and locking those shards in labyrinths to be later used basically as weapons. And fast forward to the 31st millennium. And the Emperor fights a mysterious dragon. He defeats it and locks it under the surface of Mars inside the Noctis Labyrinth. <laughs> that beast is later called the Dragon of Mars and is kept there guarded to this day. And many people believe that the dragon is actually a shard of Magladroth, the Void Dragon, one of the Catan. But what are the connections between them? Well, we know that the dragon is very old, that he used to live among the stars, that he had the power to destroy whole civilizations, and that his body is silver, which are all traits of the Catan. We actually know all of these details from the novel Mechanicum, but this theory is supported by one more point that comes from the 3rd edition Necron rulebook. Uh, where the Necrons successfully landed on Mars near the aforementioned labyrinth at the end of the 41st millennium. We don't know what they were looking for, but it definitely adds to the case. In conclusion, the Dragon of Mars is very likely to be a shard of the Void Dragon. We also know that the Dragon was worshipped by the Cult of the Dragon, and is still worshipped directly by some members of the Adeptus Mechanicus. And those who don't worship him directly might still be worshipping him accidentally, because he could actually be the machine god who is granting them the machine spirit from beneath the surface of the planet. The Rangdan. The Rangdan were a Xenos race, first encountered during the Great Crusade. They were a very powerful and numerous race with ships stronger than those of the Empire. And they gave humans a lot of bad time, slowing down and even drawing them back from expanding onto the northern regions of the galaxy for a good 60 years. And the Rangdan are mentioned in a couple of the Horus Heresy books, but we don't really know much about them. We don't know how they looked or what their culture was, but we know that they have been eventually decimated after three wars called the Rangdan Xenocides. We know that the wars took lives of over 80,000 Astartes, which is a huge number, and millions of lives of the Imperial Guard, which is like a regular number. Uh, now for the theories, the Rangdan could have been people who survived the Dark Age of Technology, they could have been a big community composed of many different species of Xenos, or they could have been led by the missing Astartes chapters. It's impossible to tell for now. Everyone is Alpharius. This meme comes from the novel Legion, in which most of the Astartes of the Alpha Legion introduce themselves as Alpharius to people from outside of the Legion. Alpharius, as previously mentioned, is the primarch of the Alpha Legion, and the reason behind Astartes introducing themselves with this name is to create the sense of solidarity and possibly to help in keeping the actual location of their primarch secure by giving false information. It's worth adding that all of the Alpha Legion's members shave their heads in order to look like the Primarch, with some even undergoing cosmetic surgery to look more like him. The fate of Rogal Dorn. Rogal Dorn was the Primarch of the Imperial Feast Legion. His fate is currently unknown, but he is believed to be dead by the Imperium at large. He supposedly died during a fight with the forces of Chaos, or at least he was last seen fighting on board a Chaos starship. 
and the one thing that remained of him is his hand, which is kept in Stasis chamber by his chapter. So him being dead seems like the most probable option. The other being that he's being kept as a prisoner, possibly by Perturabo, whose fleet he was attacking when he was last seen, and it is most unlikely that he is free, because if he was, he, he wouldn't really have a reason to hide from the Imperium for 10,000 years. What is worth noting is that in the original lore he was dead. In the novel Space Marine from 1993, his whole body is seen preserved on board of the Phalanx starship. So his status has been retconned from dead to missing in action, which probably means that we will see him again one day. The Tau were uplifted by the Eldar. Uh, this is a theory which states that the Tau were created by the Eldar. The Eldar are a race created by the Old Ones, an ancient race that eventually fell during the Warring Heaven, uh, and after that the Eldar took their place as the biggest power in the galaxy. Then the birth of Slanesh happened and Chaos became their biggest threat. So what did the Eldar do? They created the Tau, uh, a race with no warp presence, and thus immune to psychic powers of Chaos. So in summary, the Tau were created to battle Chaos for the Eldars, and the creation could have been achieved with the upgraded technology of the old ones. Malal. Malal is a Chaos God introduced in the first edition of Fantasy Warhammer RPG. He was a renegade God who turned against other Gods and dedicated himself to destroying them and their followers. He is a part of the 40k canon under the name Malice, and he even has his own Chaos Space Marine chapter, which not only fights against the Imperium of Man, but also against Chaos Legions dedicated to all other gods. Malice is undoubtedly a fifth Chaos God, but his character is almost never mentioned by Games Workshop, especially compared to other gods. This causes him to suddenly be quite irrelevant. The Emperor's Origin It's hard to tell what is canon and what is non-canon in the history of Emperor's early life, since it was first told in the first Warhammer rulebooks 30 years ago and is still expanded upon by the newest novels. Still, I'll do my best to convey the generally accepted story. So the Emperor was born on Earth in the 8th millennium before Christ, in a small village near the river Sakaria, somewhere in Anatolia Peninsula, so the region of today's Turkey. He was born as the collective reincarnation of Earth's most powerful psychers, known back then as shamans or sorcerers. Um, the part of the story that has been retconned by now is that all the shamans drank poison at the same time and thus committed mass suicide, because they knew that humanity will one day succumb to chaos and the only way to stop that is to create a super psyker with their combined souls. Anyway, the child who would later be known as the Emperor started showing very strong psychic powers, with perhaps first instance of this being when he was tending to his father's body, where he had a vision that his father has been killed by his uncle. He then approached his uncle and stopped his heart using psychic powers. Uh, as Emperor himself states, it was at this moment that he realized that humanity needed a strong law and guidance and that he should be the person who sees to it. After those events, he left his village and traveled to the first human city. Emperor was born as a perpetual, an immortal being said to be the next step in the human evolution, and he wasn't alone. Throughout his later years on Earth, the Emperor actively searched for and created other Perpetuals in order to serve him and help him make his plans come true. His plan being of course unifying the human race and speeding up the process of human evolution. In the following millennia he took different names and roles, we know that he was a king at one point, he basically did everything to learn as much as he could about chaos and the immaterium, because he knew that this would be humanity's biggest threat in the future. He influenced the world from the shadows as much as he could to over the years unite and take control over humanity. The Ghoul Stars This is a part of the galaxy that a little is known about, it is a northeastern region inhabited by Necrons, who like to wear people's skins and other friendly Xenos races that look like this. The most notable event that took place in this region was the Plague of Pale Wastings. What it was exactly is unknown, but we know that it attacked the few human worlds that were in that region, slaughtering everything on its way. Uh, the Pale Wasting was eventually stopped by 12 chapters of Space Marines, from which 11 were completely destroyed, with Nova Marines chapter being the only survivors. Uh, the Pale Wasting is described to be an ancient threat that used some kind of nightmare engines, so we can assume that it was an old and very powerful race of Xenos, whose existence was later purged from annals of history. Nowadays, the Ghoul Stars are constantly being watched by the Death Spectres and Death Watch to make sure that no threat emerges from this region. Fantasy and 40k are in the same universe. 
Well, the official statement on that from Games Workshop is that the Warhammer Fantasy World is not Terra from 40k. Uh, they are, however, in the same universe, meaning that they are connected and can both be accessed through the warp. I don't really know if you can call this canon, but my favorite example of that comes from Warhammer Monthly comic books, where a space marine is trapped inside the warp with a Chaos Warrior from Fantasy. And this just sounds like a setup to a joke, but it's real. We also have the Liber Chaotica books, that exist within fantasy lore and are talking about 40k events. Kaldor Drago presumably sees the Warhammer world while traveling through the warp in this short story. There are also some other smaller things in the lore like the Skaven calling the Eldar and orcs being present in both universes. Um, but the newest and most fresh statement seems to come from the 2018 Wife Dwarf issue where it is clearly stated that they are only connected through the warp. And all of this is cool, but does that mean that Chaos Gods can take power from other universes and not only the 40k one? Uh, because if this is the case, then the humans are even more f***ed than we previously thought. The Old Ones created the Tyranids. Uh, the Old Ones are known to create races, including the Eltari, Slan, Orcs, possibly humans, so it might be possible that they created the Tyranids. But why would they do that? Well, possibly to slow down, to balance, or to just stop and destroy all other races. Uh, however, this is just a theory without any evidence. Uh, it would mean that the Tyranids left the galaxy, forgot about it, and came back after 60 million years. I don't like this theory, it's stupid, I don't wanna talk about it, let's move on. Servitors are fully conscious and awake. Servitors are people who are sentenced to servitude in perpetuous, meaning that they are mind wiped and lobotomized. They are given mechanical parts, and they are programmed with a simple task that they will have no choice but to follow. It can't be known for certain how awake or conscious they are after that process, as they don't have any free will nor can they speak freely. However, they are surely alive, and often in the community it is stated that the most unlucky of the servitors didn't go into a vegetative state, but rather retained some of their memories, feelings and thoughts. And this seems to be somewhat confirmed in the Master of Mankind, where an Adeptus Mechanicus reads the memories of a dead female servitor, and it turns out that the last thing she thought about was the moment she was taken away from her children, which for me is one of the darkest and most horrifying moments in 40k. Even though it is stated that the memory was caused by the outburst of emotion in the moments of death, so perhaps the servitor wasn't aware of the memory for its whole existence, uh, still a terrifying thought. A Sigmar is one of the lost Primarchs. Even though we established that fantasy and 40k can sometimes interconnect, this is still a highly unlikely theory. Um, this theory is mainly supported by two facts. First being that Sigmar's birth has been accompanied by a falling of a twin-tailed comet, which could be a pod falling from the skies in which the Primarch was kept. Uh, the other fact being his unnatural power. But still, this would mean that he was the strongest of Primarchs, with power coming close to that of the Emperor. Also, this would contradict the Lost Primarchs being expelled from history for doing something really wrong, which we already established is true. The ghost of Ferus Manus leads the Legion of the Damned. Uh, so Ferus Manus was a Primarch of the Iron Hands Legion, who was beheaded by Fulgrim at the beginning of Horus Heresy. And the Legion of the Damned has to be the most mysterious chapters of Space Marines. Um, their allegiance is to the Imperium, but they are all tainted by warp, which slowly destroys their bodies and their psyche. But in exchange, they grow in power, becoming stronger than any other Astartes, and basically they are immune to almost all forms of regular weaponry. Uh, they are also known to appear out of nowhere, assist other Imperial troops in fights that seem impossible to win, and then they disappear without a trace. Uh, now, this theory comes from the Master of Mankind, the part where the Emperor starts having some trouble during a fight and summons what appears to be dead space marines who are led by Ferus Manus. The summoned space marines appear to look inhuman just like the Legion of the Damned. And that is basically it for the theory. People speculate that this was the first appearance of the Legion and since Ferus appeared with them, it means that they are led by him in the following battles. But still, there is no confirmation that this was the Legion of the Damned. It could have just been a manifestation of Emperor's enormous psychic powers. Conrad Curse faked his own death. Uh, Conrad Curse is said to have died at the hands of a Kaledus assassin at the end of the Horus Heresy. Conrad had a power, or rather a curse, of seeing the future, and as he states in his final words, 
He knew that the assassin would come for him and he presumably allowed for that to happen, as he wanted to die by imperial hand to vindicate himself and all of his actions. The moment of his death is never directly described, which is enough for the theories to emerge. We only know what happened from a video log, uh, in which the assassin attacks Conrad and then the video cuts off. However, it is later described that the assassin cuts off the head of the Primarch to take as a trophy. So the theory states that Conrad knew about the assassin and thus he could prepare himself to pull off this trick and use this opportunity to disappear. But first he would have to defeat the assassin and second, uh, convince her or trick her into telling a false story to her master and also into taking a fake head with her, which is let's say unlikely to happen for a brainwashed Imperial assassin. Malkador's past. The history of Malkador's past is spread across many different sources and is mostly a mystery to all but Malkador himself. He states that he was born 6700 years before the Horus Heresy and he met the Emperor before or during the Unification Wars and became his advisor. He was also the one who suggested that the Emperor should take the name Emperor. Before all of that he was also a member of an organization called the Sigilites who were dedicated to preserving all the greatest human artifacts and weapons. But that is not all, as in the short story Last Council, Malkador is visited by Jagatai Khan, who tells that Horus had studied his past and learned some juicy facts in the process. Uh, apparently Malkador's real name is Bram Alkador, and he is a perpetual, which shouldn't be too surprising, we also learn that Malkador along with his order, had committed some horrible crimes during the Age of Strife. Uh, Khan also states that by learning about Malkador's past, he realized that the Imperial truth was based on lies, and that humanity shouldn't be let that the Emperor and Malkador doesn't even try to argue with him. It seems that he had done something really, really bad in the past. The Watchers in the Dark are squads. So the Watchers in the Dark are these weird little hooded creatures. They serve the Dark Angels chapter, but they never speak or fight directly. They also have a unique psychic power that renders them immune to damage. Who they are isn't exactly known. They are most likely a Xenos race, but there is also a theory that they are squads. Now squads are a subspecies of the human race, once cut off from the rest of humanity, later rediscovered during the Great Crusade. And the one thing that made them stand out was their short size, similar to the size of the Watchers. And now the squads all presumably died when their worlds were attacked by Tyranids, and according to the theory, the Watchers are actually the last of the squads, even though squads didn't have the special psychic power and they would have to acquire it later somehow. And the only evidence that would support the theory is that the Dark Angels chapter lets them live, so they might be some form of a human being and not a Xeno. I have to admit that only after writing these words I realized that this theory is a joke and I took it far too seriously, so let's move on. The lost Primarchs became Gork and Mork. Yes, obviously, that is the only explanation that is reasonable. I could argue that Gork and Mork are millions of years old, just like orcs, and they were created long before humans were created, but let's just stick with this theory. But if this is your headcanon, I'm not judging, this would actually be pretty sick. The Star Child. So I already talked about the Illuminati and how they had a grand plan to gather all the Emperor's children and sacrifice them at the moment of Emperor's death so that a new and stronger Emperor could be born. Uh, this would be achieved thanks to the Star Child, which is the soul of the Emperor, the same soul that was created from the collective sacrifice of all the shamans and sorcerers. Not much else to say about this since this is all ancient lore by now. The Demonculaba. In the novel Dead Sky Black Sun, the ultramarine Uriel Ventris infiltrates the ranks of Iron Warriors and finds imprisoned people who are used to breed new Chaos Space Marines. Now there is no way I can talk about the specifics of this process without getting demonetized and without getting nauseous to be honest with you, so I might just leave you with a wiki link so you can read it for yourself if you want to know all the horrible gory details of what happens to people captured by Chaos Servants. The Dornian Heresy this is a fanfiction which tells an alternate story of the heresy in which Rogal Dorn succumbs to the ruinous powers instead of Horus. It was made by Aurelius Rex and is presented in the form of a beautiful PDF. The Dornian heresy is regarded very highly among the community, so if you are going to read any fanfiction, this should probably be it. The Little Girl of the Crystal Maze Inside Tsinch's domain there is a illusory and mysterious crystal labyrinth. Within it there are nine gates, each guarded by a being 
cleverly named Guardian of the Maze. If you walk up to any of the gays, the Guardian will ask you a question. If you answer all 9 questions correctly, you will unlock a secret path, and going down that path will give you infinite knowledge. Now, according to the story, the only person who ever completed the labyrinth was a little unnamed girl accompanied by a small black dog. It is most likely just a throwaway event, plus a cool reference to Wizard of Oz. However, it still could be speculated that the girl was actually the Emperor traversing the warp after walking into the Chaos Gate of Molek, since we don't know what exactly happened in there, but we know that he had new knowledge when he came out. Still, it's a huge stretch and we'll never know for sure. Fionite Inquisitors There are plenty of factions and philosophies among the Inquisition, and most of them were made for the Dark Heresy game. And among those, most are pretty tame with their ideas, they just serve the Imperium in their own way. Then there are some who get more extreme, and after that there are the plain good old heretics, who turn their backs on the Emperor, such as the Fionites, who at one point felt betrayed by the Imperium because of not getting enough support against Xenos attacks, and decided to officially leave and turn to Chaos. In exchange, their homeworld Fion Prime got the Exterminatus treatment in a form of a virus bomb, leaving only few survivors. However, that wasn't enough and the Fionites soon returned, which resulted in a second Exterminatus in a form of pulling a moon into the planet to destroy it once and for all. <laughs> However, it's likely that some of them still survived while being off-world. And the Fionites, other than being Chaos cultists, are very keen on technology, especially if it comes from the Dark Age of Technology and is somewhat connected to the warp, so they probably have some bigger plan. The Golden Throne runs on Dark Eldar technology. And the Dark Eldar specialize in technology connected to soul and well torture, and the Golden Throne could be seen as a giant torture device that keeps the Emperor barely alive in a constant state of agony, and additionally it's imprisoning his soul. As stated before, there must be a reason why the Inquisition brought a humunculus to Terra. They must know or at least suspect that the Drukari are able to understand and fix the internal mechanisms. And once again I'll mention the pact that has been made between the Imperium and Eldar of Komora, as it most likely concerns the Emperor himself or the throne. Sanguinius killed Horus and was put down by Emperor, so Sanguinius was known to have visions about his battle with Horus, and he knew that only one of them could come out alive. He also struggled with Red First, a mutation that was causing all blood angels to have a near irresistible craving for blood. Once affected by the Red First, they would become unstoppable monsters and go completely berserk. And according to the theory, this is what happened on Terra. Sanguinius, seeing his corrupted brother, gave in to the curse and killed him with ease before he could be stopped by the Emperor who he attacked immediately after. Uh, and supposedly Sanguinius was the one who dealt the mortal wound to the Emperor. While this would add another layer of tragedy to the story, I think that it's highly unlikely that this is the truth, since it would contradict one of the most important pieces of Warhammer art and make years of lore building irrelevant. The Hrud are humans going back in time. The Hrud are a somewhat humanoid species of Xenos, they have been around for longer than humans and they have one special ability that lets them control time. We can only see them altering the flow of time in small areas like they can make a crop grow faster or make someone age 20 years within seconds. And this theory actually comes from the Perturabo Primark novel and it honestly seems like nothing more than a throwaway line set by a Magos named Turin who thought that they are humans from the far future, perhaps the end of time and maybe they are running away from something horrible. The Shape of the Nightmare to Come This is a Warhammer fanfiction set in the year 50k, uh, created by Lord Lucan. I personally haven't read it yet, but I know that it starts with the fall of Imperium, which makes it super interesting. It even got its sequel, set in the 60th millennium, called The Age of Dusk. The Horus Heresy was expected, but didn't go as planned. This is a theory that I will discuss in some of the upcoming points, no reason to talk about it extensively on its own, uh, as it connects to many other theories that are further down the iceberg. If you've enjoyed this video so far, consider subscribing to the channel, I will make sure to provide some more quality Warhammer content. But for now, let's get into the depths. The Emperor promised half of his sons to the Chaos Gods. This seems to be one of the more popular theories concerning the Emperor's time within the Warp. We know that the Emperor entered the Warp 
and somehow interacted with the Chaos Gods. And when he came out, he had the knowledge necessary to create the Primarchs. All sources of information about what happened inside come from demons and you really shouldn't trust demons, as they said that the Emperor stole something from the gods or that his inhuman powers were granted to him inside the world. All we can do is speculate and one of the theories that emerge is that the Emperor promised half of the Primarchs to Chaos Gods in exchange for the knowledge on how to create them. Uh, this would mean that the Emperor knew that the heresy would eventually come and this would explain why he treated some of his sons so poorly from the beginning. Take Angron for example. Uh, before he was discovered by the Emperor he was a gladiator forced to fight for entertainment. He spent years gaining strength and uniting other prisoners in order to escape his masters. Eventually his plan succeeded and he escaped taking thousands with him. His glory didn't last long as only a couple of years later he and the remainder of his army found themselves surrounded by the planet's armies. At that point Angron knew that it was over but he was happy to die among his brothers. Uh, but then the Emperor came and ruined everything as he often does, taking Angron away by force and making him watch his army get decimated while making remarks about how insignificant they were. Uh, yeah, not very father-like. Now why would the Emperor ruin a relationship with his son before even properly starting it? Well, the reason could be that he knew that Angron would eventually turn to chaos, so he didn't care about him from the beginning. But to somewhat contradict this, we also know how much love and care he put into Horus, and we know that he initially didn't believe that Horus was the original traitor, so these two things kinda contradict each other unless the children who would betray him weren't specified and he was pushing some in the way of chaos and treating others very well so they would stay loyal. If this theory was true, it would also probably mean that one of the Lost Legion Primarchs turned to chaos before or after he was expelled from history. And the next thing worth mentioning is how the Emperor treated the heresy. Uh, we can't really say that he didn't care, but he definitely underreacted, spending most of his time working on the Webway project. So what if he thought that he had tricked the gods by using their knowledge to create the Webway project, which would ultimately cut off humans from the warp and in result defeat Chaos. Of course, the one thing he couldn't predict was Magnus, who was tricked by Tsinch, just like the Emperor was while making the bargain, it all connects. Chaos has already won. Chaos is formed of emotions. And until there is anger, lust, ambition, hope and other extreme emotions in the galaxy, the chaos will grow stronger. The only way to truly defeat chaos is to eradicate the galaxy of all organisms that have warp presence and can feel these emotions. Or to somehow make everyone stop experiencing them. But if we give it a longer thought, we could still come to a conclusion that this wouldn't be enough, since there are many other galaxies, possibly with other sentient species, whose minds are connected to the Immaterium. And if we take into account that the warp is connecting an infinite number of universes, like the Fantasy Universe for example, we can safely assume that it will never run out of power. The three main Tyranid fleets were just scouting parties. And this information comes from the third edition of Tyranids Codex. After the defeat of High Fleet Leviathan, a secret group called the Strategic Collective has been established with a goal of getting as much information about Tyranids as possible. And their biggest breakthrough was that the three main high fleets that the Imperium encountered so far are a small part of a much bigger threat that will arrive in the galaxy within a century. And if humanity wants to survive this, they must recruit every single man, woman and child in the galaxy. And also with images like this coming from official Games Workshop sources, it's safe to assume that the Tyranids won't stop coming from the Void of Space for a long time. Lorgar regrets betraying his father and has been slowly going mad with guilt for 10,000 years. So during the Great Crusade, Lorgar and his legion the Wordbearers were spending a lot of time meticulously getting rid of all accounts of religious worship that they were able to find. Also in that time Lorgar decided to start his own religion as he was the first one to believe that the Emperor should be worshipped as a godlike being. So he started creating a city dedicated to the worship called Monarchia. And obviously the Emperor didn't like that and ordered Gilliman and his ultramarines to destroy the city, while Lorgar and his legion were forced to kneel and watch it burn. Uh, this event not only started Lorgar's turn to chaos, but also it made him think that Gilliman hates and despises him. This feeling grew in him and eventually was one of the reasons of him becoming the servant of chaos. 
Years later, in the events described in the book Betrayer, during the Horus heresy, Lorgar and Gilman met again. And at that moment, Lorgar realized that he was wrong the whole time, as only now Gilman looked him in the eyes and expressed emotions far greater that were between them until that moment. There was pure rage, hatred and pain of a betrayed brother in them. I just have to cite the book here. The bearer of the word felt a sudden burning need to explain everything, to justify himself, to tell how this was all necessary, all of it, to enlighten the humanity, the rebellion, the war, the heresy. The truth or reality was foul, but it had to be told. But of course it was too late to have a conversation, they had to fight. A Lorgar came out alive and actually lived to the end of the Horus heresy, after which he retreated into the Eye of Terror, ascended into demonhood and locked himself away in solitude for 10,000 years. I don't think that he's going mad, as he once left his place of isolation to help his legion and he was as sane as a demon could be, but judging from his thoughts during the battle with Gilliman and his long isolation, there might still be some regret in him. The Emperor will become a fifth Chaos God. Uh, this has been a big point of debate among the community for years and there are a couple of branching theories about it. One of them being that the Emperor's actions started the creation of another entity within the warp, composed of this belief that he forced upon the people and once he dies his soul will join these accumulated feelings and form a chaos god, one that could potentially destroy other gods. Another theory is that his soul alone is so powerful that once it joins the immaterium it will be enough to create a being at a power level similar to that of the four gods. <coughs> but that wouldn't necessarily make him a chaos god, as each of them is composed of different emotions and emperor's soul would just be a different kind of being. However, it could be powered by the worship that he constantly gets from the masses of the Imperium. It is also theorized that he had offered his soul to Chaos Gods in exchange for knowledge, thinking that he would trick them by escaping into the webway, but then of course Magnus did nothing wrong and now Emperor wants to prolong his stay in this world by extending his life using the Golden Throne, but giving up his soul to Chaos would still not make him a Chaos God. Nothing is canon. This pretty much comes down to the quote of Mark Gascoigne, who was a head of Black Library at one point, citing Yes, it's all official, but remember that we are reporting back from a time where stories aren't always true or at least 100% accurate. If it has the 40k logo on it, it exists in the 40k universe or it was a legend that may well have happened, or a rumor that may or may not have any truth behind it. Let's put it another way. Anything with a 40k logo on it is as official as any codex and at least as crammed full of rumors, distorted legends and half-truths. I think the real problem for me, and I speak for no other, is that the topic as a big question doesn't matter, it's all as true as everything else, and all just as false, half-remembered, sort of true. The answer you are seeking for is yes and no, or perhaps sometimes. And for me, that's the end of it. Now this might just be a lazy way to explain all existing and future retcons, but it is what it is and we can't be certain of anything in the lore. The Terminus Decree orders the eradication of humanity. The Terminus Decree is a set of instructions set to be written by the Emperor. The instructions are to be read and executed when there is no hope for the humanity. The ancient tome is in possession of the Grey Knights, and only the members of the highest ranks know about its existence. And as set in the 8th edition of Great Knight Codex, Caldor Drago is currently considering using the decree. Of course there is no way of knowing what is inside, but one possibility is that there is an order of eradicating all humanity from the galaxy. As we know, the Emperor hated chaos like nothing else, and he predicted that it would be the biggest threat to humanity. Humanity. So perhaps, in the event of losing all hope of ever overcoming it, the human race should just stop existing, rather than completely give in to the ruinous powers. It is said in the Codex that the seal protecting the decree looks exactly like the seal on the Golden Throne, so perhaps opening the decree will cause the Golden Throne to deactivate, opening a warp portal on Terra and turning off the Astronomicon and dooming the human race in the process. However, this could also mean that the Emperor will be reborn, and ready to once more guide people with his full power. Horus sits on the Golden Throne. Uh, I'm pretty sure that this refers to a fanfic called The Truth About the Emperor, in which Horus completely kills the Emperor and barely survives the fight himself, but thanks to his psychic powers he is able to influence Rogal's mind so that he picks up Horus's body 
to plant on the throne instead of the emperors. As far as I know, that is all and there is not a single piece of evidence Horus being on the throne. We know that Horus' body has been taken and preserved and that the emperor gave an order to put him on the throne, so all theories concerning this are pretty far-fetched. The Emperor always knew he would fail. There is a lot of evidence that supports this. Um, there is the fact that he treated some of his Primarchs like Lorgar and Engron worse than the others, like he knew that they would turn to chaos anyway at some point. Uh, the Emperor also had some precognition powers, as he explained in the novel Master of Mankind. He could see a presumably infinite number of possible futures, but he wasn't able to see what events must happen in order to reach any of them. So he must have seen the future in which he is betrayed by Horus, but he probably just wasn't expecting that this one would turn out to be true. He created the Adeptus Custodes, the most powerful warriors who specialize in defensive actions and fighting against Chaos. He made them specifically stronger than Space Marines before there even were Chaos Space Marines. Another thing that he did was establishing the Council of Terra, a government that was able to run without his help. Another point, in the novel Pharos, Curse and Sanguinius have a conversation in which they both agree that the Emperor isn't telling them the whole truth, as everything concerning the Primarchs seems to be a little bit too perfect, especially the fact that they all landed on planets that perfectly suited them. He also does not seem shocked enough when he learns about Primarchs going against him, it is only when he learns about Horus's betrayal that he cannot believe it, so perhaps he knew that the heresy would come, he just wasn't expecting his favorite son to betray him. Malkador was running a coup. I'll be honest with you, I couldn't really find any information about this theory and even the Iceberg's creator doesn't know what it refers to, so I'll leave it for now and maybe make a separate video when I find out what it refers to. The Horus Heresy happens on an alternate timeline. This theory states that the Emperor had experienced the Heresy multiple times and each time it played out a bit differently. The Horus Heresy that we know about is one of the possible outcomes that is being played out currently, but perhaps this is the right one that needs to be played out in order for humanity to win. It all begins with Emperor's psychic powers. As stated before, the Emperor could see different possible futures, but he didn't know how to get to each one of them. So what if he was powerful enough to somehow project possible futures and leave them, to see which one would result in Chaos's destruction, or what if he had the power to go back in time and try different things until he would find the perfect future. Uh, okay, but what could prove such a crazy theory? Uh, to be honest, this Reddit thread. So far I tried to pull from as many sources as I could to fact check everything, but I couldn't possibly do a better job than this guy, so definitely check out his post, link will be in the description, and I'll just give a quick rundown of the bigger points he makes. First of all, Emperor's time travel might be possible, as we see a vision in the Outcast Death novel in which time moves backwards and Chaos is seemingly defeated. There is also a vision presented to the Emperor that he must be defeated in the battle against Horus so that humanity might survive. All of this also ties to the Emperor knowing he would have to die uh, theory. In the Bort is Set short story, Emperor tells Malkador that he plans to sacrifice himself at the end of the war. And there are strange interactions between Horus and the Emperor when he seems not to recognize his son or not to remember his words like he was confusing Horuses from different realities. There is also a lot of inconsistencies in the Siege of Terra novels, like characters who die but appear later in the story uh, and others suddenly changing their personalities. And the one big point that I like the most being that the Horus who came out from the portal on Molek isn't the same Horus who entered it, and this could be attributed to the fact that he had thought that an unimaginable amount of time had passed since he entered the portal, and also that his personality changed completely during that time. We are the Chaos Gods. When we play the miniature game, we take full control of armies composed of all types of species. We make them fight, we make them die, we laugh at them, we dispose of them where they are no longer useful and we never feel sorry for them. We don't care about their feelings, we use them as tools for our enjoyment and they can do anything to stop us. We are the Chaos Gods. And that is all, thank you for watching. If I had made any mistakes, please let me know in the comments below. And if you liked the video, you can consider making a one-time donation to the channel, link will be in the description. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one where I'll be reviewing Warhammer Mobile Games.